uh, that shows how uh, system dynamics can be used for an actual application. Uh, in this case, the application is water resources. Uh, and uh, the location of this case study is in South Florida. Uh, so I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, first, uh, this is a project that is ongoing. Um, it was funded uh, by NOAA through its uh, sectoral applications research program, SARP. Um, it's got uh, some collaborators from a couple of universities, uh, and you can see this uh, pretty, pretty interdisciplinary team, social scientists, economists, myself, as a hydrologist, uh, climate scientist, uh, and also a couple of students uh, are involved to date. Um, give you a little bit of an outline uh, and the context of water resources planning in South Florida. Um, the context itself and some of the challenges that, that are identified and you know in, in, in any given situation water resources uh, management is got its own nuances so I'll, I'll show you what those are in the case of South Florida. Uh, I'll talk to you also a little bit about the model development, um, in this case the system dynamics model that was done uh, for this application and how it was done and, and, and how it's being used. Um, so the system dynamics model itself, uh, the, the, the data sources that we use to assemble it and, and some of the policies that um, have been tested through this case study and uh, we look at some, some of the simulations and uh, discussion of results. So first, let me give you a little bit of a hydrologic picture of South Florida. This is the, the Florida Peninsula. Um, and uh, it's, um, it's very interesting. It's a very interesting um, hydrologic setting. Um, and it's got some, uh, some very particular issues. The, um, uh, just to give you a little bit of a context, uh, the topography of this site is extremely flat. Um, it's got a pretty much a single major lake that functions as a, as, as a key reservoir to store water. There's not a whole lot of ability, there's no topography here for, for other water storage features. Uh, and uh, the urban development that has been taking place in this uh, eastern urban corridor from you know, West Palm Beach down to Miami and further down, uh, where right now something between 6 million and 8 million people live, it's, uh, it's quite interesting because uh, uh, this used to be, uh, and I'll show you some, some, some images, this used to be a, a very large wetland. Uh, and wetlands, um, um, it's, it, they're essentially environments that like to, like to stay wet. So um, controlling uh, flooding in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a wetland that has been uh, converted to urban, an urban environment is quite of a challenge. So let me tell you a little bit about this, uh, the, sort, sort of the big numbers. Um, rainfall is about 55 inches per year. Um, and the evapotranspiration, um, so what's transferred back to the atmosphere is about 40 inches. So that leaves about 15 inches of water per year uh, on the ground. Um, and uh, it's got pretty, pretty flat topography, as I mentioned. Uh, it's got karstic soils, and what this means is that the, the soils are highly permeable. Uh, which means that, um, uh, you know, uh, water likes to infiltrate on the ground. So of those 15 inches, there's a fair amount of water that resides in the ground. And that's, that's a key, you know, key feature. Uh, but also, this is, a, this is a very low topography. So these, um, these karstic soils essentially retain water in the ground, but very close to the surface. So there's a, uh, um, there's a very tight connection between surface water and groundwater features here. And then, of course, there's the influence of the, of the coastal zones, both, both on the east side um, uh, and on the west side of the peninsula. Uh, and that, uh, that actually has a, had a, has a pretty big influence uh, with, a, a, with connecting the, the water environment to the, to the marine environment. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, and as I mentioned, the you know, Lake Okeechobee here is, is the, it's the really only major reservoir. Um, as I'll explain uh, a little bit uh, later, uh, there are some features here that I'll, that I'll talk about. Um, these um, water conservation areas, WCAs, are essentially uh, man-made, uh, um, very low elevation reservoirs that, that have been built to create an ability to store water. Um, but because they need to be very shallow, because you, you can't really uh, build uh, you know, very large structures in this environment, um, also because the karstic soils would not support 
uh, these heavy, you know, heavy infrastructure, then you, you you live in a very interesting interesting situation in which you you need to to store water to provide flood control for the urban urban environment, but at the same time you don't have the ability to build that that storage because it doesn't exist either. So let's talk a little bit further about that. Um, the the um, the water in, in, in the state of Florida is uh, essentially managed through five uh, what are called water management districts. The one that I'll focus today in the discussion is the South Florida Water Management District, which encompasses uh, this region here um, that contains Lake Okeechobee and, of course, all the environment I was just referring to. There are other four that cover uh, other four districts that cover the rest of the state. So let's talk specifically about the South Florida Water Management District. Um, and again, the purview of, of its coverage is it's here. Um, and um, let me walk you a little bit about how water circulates in the system. First of all, it, it is pretty, it's a pretty flat environment, as I mentioned. Um, uh, water is essentially, it's, it, it's uh, mostly drains from north to south. Uh, there is a series of um, uh, rivers and 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 uh, small lakes uh, uh, referred to as a ch as a chain of lakes uh, up near Orlando, and uh, those uh, those features uh, collect water from rain, um, and they start draining south uh, primarily through the Kissimmee River. Okay, the Kissimmee River fe feeds Lake Okeechobee. Uh, Lake Okeechobee I usually refer to as the heart of the South Florida hydrologic system because Lake Okeechobee is is the is the organism uh, that that uh, receives uh, water from the north and then distributes it. And, and Lake Okeechobee, once it receives water, it, it, it has three um, uh, basic outlets. Uh, uh, one is to the east uh, through the St. Lucie River, um, and that river essentially uh, discharges eventually to the uh, to the to Florida's east coast. Uh, to the west, the Caloosahatchee River, uh, which drains water uh, from the lake all the way to the west and then to, to the uh, Gulf of Mexico on this side. Um, and then um, there is a, um, a, a drainage uh, that goes through a series of, uh, of, of features. Uh, the, um, there is a large agricultural area um, that takes water from that drainage from the lake for agricultural purposes. Uh, there are these uh, water conservation areas which are anthropogenically built reservoirs uh, and the purpose of those reservoirs is essentially to control the flow of water to the south because um, in this corridor here um, between West Palm Beach and, and Miami you have a you have a, a, a pretty much a continuous urban uh, corridor uh, that's fully built uh, and uh, it's still actually still in development uh, then uh, towards further towards the south you have uh, now the ecosystem features of um, of the system, the you know the majority of this part of South Florida used to be a wetland, as I'll show you. But now there's two um, uh, two major ecosystems. Uh, uh, one is the Big Cypress National Preserve, um, which uh, tends to be mostly um, you know woody species uh, cypress, um, and it's a um, it's a, what what we would call a wetland savanna. It's it's savanna environment, but it's a uh, it's it's a pretty, it's a pretty human environment, and then you have the the um, the wetlands per se, which is which are now um, confined to what's known as the Everglades National Park. Okay, um, once water goes through all of these features and it's used and and and, and recycled and um, and infiltrated into the ground, the the base flow and, and, and the the overall drainage uh, goes down uh, through Florida Bay. Uh, so that's a little bit of the picture of the. Um, you know of the hydrologic system there. Uh, just to give you some again uh, some of the big numbers. Uh, as of 2005, it's uh, over seven million people. I think today it's that figure is closer to eight million people. Um, it's, it's about 45 percent of, of Florida's population. Uh, the overall area is uh, 70,000 square miles, which is about 31 percent of the area of the state of Florida. Uh, you have the Everglades wetland here, confined now to uh, the Everglades National Park, and you have Lake Okeechobee as the um, as the main um, hydrologic surface water body um, that sort of drives uh, drainage in the system. Um, 
and uh, Lake Okeechobee uh, is uh, it's involved in anything that has, has to do with water supply and flood control. Um, you have the Everglades agricultural area uh, where uh, there are sugar cane, sage, citrus, and vegetables that are grown. It's a very big industry in Florida. Uh, these, w, uh, these WCAs, the water conservation areas, work essentially as shallow impoundments, and these are these are very large pools of water that are probably you know a few feet deep. You know, uh, in the majority of cases uh, might be. Um, I think in the at, at the highest that there might be six or seven feet um, deep, and, and at the lowest they can be actually be completely dry. And uh, and uh, as I mentioned before, also uh, the, the karstic soils uh, present a situation in which there is a continuous interaction between you know groundwater and surface water. Okay, so there's really it's really difficult to differentiate those two environments because you really have this very very permeable soil close uh, to the surface. Let's look at a little bit of the land use, and, and uh, you know, before the 1950s, the majority of the of the South Florida environment um, was a you know was was a sort of natural wetland, uh, you know, a good portion with water, uh, but mostly vegetation. Uh, there was a little bit of urban development, uh, and uh, again, you have uh, you know West Palm going down. Uh, and um, and uh, you know Miami being developed, uh, Fort Lauderdale somewhere in the middle. Uh, certainly not not a whole lot going on there by the, by the 1950s. And there was some agricultural activity, uh, particularly in the vicinity of the lake, because of you know of, of good quality soils and and availability of water for irrigation. So that was a picture. Um, and uh, if you look at uh, 20 years later in, in the 70s, uh, you can see now uh, a lot more urban development. Uh, this urban corridor took off, um, and uh, in, in doing that also, the agricultural activity took off. Uh, you can see a lot of more agriculture expanding, um, and, um, and, uh, and certainly uh, less at the expense of the natural environment. If you want to look further uh, to the mid-90s, um, you, you know, the situation, essentially the trend was accentuated. Now you have you know, a lot more urban, um, you know, a lot more agriculture, less you know, less, uh, um, you know, natural environment. And that has continued to, to date. If you want to see how uh, these uh, maps translate into charts, uh, here uh, there's a plot uh, of the actual square miles that have been transformed over the past few decades. And you can see that the natural system has been going down. Uh, the agricultural system sort of went up and, and stabilized, and it's, it's remained fairly constant through the years. Uh, this big increase here, um, as, as, as you probably... Uh, have surmised if if you know a little bit of the history of South Florida, uh, was the big increase in sugarcane production because of the embargo to Cuba. You know, most of the of the sugar that we consumed in the country before the, the 1950s came from Cuba. When the when the embargo started, uh, uh, South Florida had to pick up a little bit of the slack, and that uh, that you know that resulted in this large growth in agricultural production. Uh, you can also see the urban uh, corridor growing uh, as we saw. And the sort of the water covered environment sort of flat out. Um, so that's a little bit of how that has progressed over the past few decades. Um, here's a chart of the population, and you can see the population has been growing at a very, very fast uh, pass rate. You know, this is a, um, uh, of course, the 2020 is a proje projection, but if, if I think if you look at, you know, at 2010, you know, we're certainly past uh, the, um, the 7 million mark, and we're also, we're almost uh, at. at as of uh, as of that census, we're actually getting closer to to the eight million eight million mark. Certainly, from from way below, uh, um, and, you know, a few decades ago. So so that's a little bit of the situation. Uh, if you if we want to look at the water demand, uh, the water demand picture is not terribly unusual. Uh, the la a large fraction, the largest fraction is agricultural. Um, and that's um, and that's primarily what's called here self-supply. So this is mostly uh, through wells or 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 through surface um, through surface water uh, irrigation. Uh, you have uh, the public water supply uh, is the second largest chunk, and then you know you have the rest. Uh, you know recreation here, a little bit of commercial uh, and domestic self-supply uh, to complete the picture. Uh, and the table below. Here has not only the percentages but also the actual um, 
volumes of water in, in million uh, gallons per day, okay, for uh, the South Florida, uh, for, for, for the purview of the South Florida Water Management District. So we're looking at, you know, 3.7, 3 uh, you know, billion gallons per day of, of water. Um, if we look at water sources, uh, overall the groundwater supply is about 53% of the total fresh water demand. Um, and um, if you look at drinking water, 90% uh, of that comes from groundwater, 10% from surface water. Uh, and uh, if you look at agricultural water, it's, uh, it's, it's sort of the other way around. But again, it's uh, the overall, it's, that's how it works out to this 53%. Um, we talked about rainfall, uh, the, the distribution, the annual distribution is about 55 inches. And about three quarters of that fall in the rainy season uh, between May and October. So that's right in this, in this range. You can see a little bit of the distribution between uh, wet and dry months. Um, and that 55 can go as low as 44 um, every 10 years or so, uh, just judging from historical averages, and it can go and can go up to 62 and a half inches on a wet year. So that's a little bit of the uh, of the picture for for water availability. So really, South Florida is a classical example of human uh, versus ecosystem conflicts over water. I mean, you have human development, you know, urban, agricultural versus at the expense of uh, an ecosystem that was there to begin with. Uh, you have population growth and urban expansion. Uh, you have the resulting increasing water demand from that expansion. Uh, the, um, one of the things that was realized very quickly in Florida is that growth at the expense of the, of the ecosystem was not going to be sustainable. So, uh, Roughly about 20 years ago, there was a um, there was a big um, uh, a big start of, of a movement to uh, restore uh, uh, the Everglades and um, uh, the restoration effort. It's uh, it's underway. It was initially thought to cost some somewhere around 10 billion dollars. Uh, I've seen numbers, you know, from eight to 10 over 20 or 30 years. Uh, and that is progressing very, very slowly uh, because of funds availability, but it is taking place as we speak. Uh, and um, the you know a lot of the reason for this is because as 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 water is is consumed further and further, uh, and you have the influence of the coastal environment, then you have the salinity trickling in uh, through groundwater wells and through surface water bodies. <clears throat> I'm sorry, and that that, that creates a uh, an issue with saltwater intrusion, and uh, with salinization of the freshwater sources. So there is a need, uh, and there is a uh, there is a uh, a a uh, part of, of of the of the goals of uh, development in South Florida is to restore uh, minimums levels and flows for Lake Okeechobee and and other water bodies to prevent desalinization from, from happening. You have issues of flood control continuously because you again you are in a low topography area that's very flat and has a lot of water uh, and of course um, you have the issues of climate variability and change. Uh, the Florida Peninsula is, is, is um, one of the areas of the country where the climate signals uh, actually have a big impact. Uh, when there is an El Nino event, for example, uh, a warm face of, of Enso, uh, the of a Nino Southern Oscillation phenomena, the uh, rainfall in South Florida can go up, to, you know, ten to twenty percent. And when, when there's La Nina, the dry face, uh, rainfall can go up down thirty percent. Uh, so you you do have a, a very climate sensitive environment. Uh, so issues of climate variability and climate change, uh, sea level rise, all these have a have uh, you know potential impacts on, on, on managing water in South Florida. So there's two key questions that drove this study. The first one is um, you know first of all let's look at the uh, you know what would be the major effects of population uh, growth and climate variability and change on the water system, uh, both on the demand side 
because of population and also on the availability side because of the climate issue. That was the first question on the impacts of, and that, that drove the development of this model. The second one is uh, what try to understand what will be the most promising policies for to manage water in response to to these triggers of population growth and climate change. So those were the two major driving questions going into this. The policy scenarios that we we start to look at uh, first um, from from the demand side. Look at the urban water use. Um, would conservation approaches work? Uh, anything that had to do with, with water smart appliances, um, landscaping, also the pricing side of water uh, and how that might affect demand, uh, land use change, uh, issues of water reuse, um, and uh, and looking at at at, um, at urban planning and urban density and how that would affect urban water use and the demand for water. Then we also looked at uh, also from a policy standpoint on agricultural water use, and that had to do with uh, you know anything from changing crops to looking at the efficiency of irrigation, which is a, a big a big issue in South Florida. And then we also looked at more user driven considerations. Uh, for example, you know what happens as you um, as you move the lands that are being used for agriculture um, into into the urban environment you know what what happens when you do that swap um, how do you manage drought conditions um, are there any other reuse options and and, and of course uh, you know the the use of climate model information in water resources modeling uh, for for the purposes of, of, of uh, assessing the the climate change uh, and climate variability impacts um, and the outcomes that we were looking to to uh, to pin down with this model first, um, you know, look at at water demand quantitatively for the urban, agricultural, and environmental settings. With environmental being um, the ecosystem uh, part of of the of the of the South Florida water uh, system. Look at from the supply side. Look at water availability, um, both surface, uh, for you know, driven primarily through the Lake Okeechobee level, which is the, the main reservoir. The volume of groundwater, um, and then also looking at uh, how land use is changing. You know, the natural piece, the urban piece, the agricultural piece, and, and the water piece. Okay, so those were the um, you know the outcomes that will tell us. Uh, how well these policies, if implemented, might work. So, we developed a system dynamics model that had um, uh, was fed by you know by by policies um, you know uh, you know policy type information. We were going to try different things, and also, of course, with hydro hydrologic data that I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, as well, and uh, and then that model would. Would be primarily focused on, de on delivering outcomes, you know, quantity of, of, of water, uh, failures in the system. So when you know what happens when if the system fails to uh, to deliver uh, on the required outcomes, you know, it fails to deliver environmental flow, or it fails to deliver a demanded flow for urban or for agricultural purposes. We um, use the model in um, in calibration. Form that means uh, trying to reproduce the system uh, as it exists today uh, between 1975 and 2005. Um, and um, um, by the way, I noticed that this here is a um, there's, there's an error here, so I'm gonna I need to fix that. Uh, and um, then um, in simulation form until 2035, which was the planning horizon. Okay. So let's talk about model data. Uh, first, population, which was provided by uh, uh, the Bureau of Environment and Business uh, in Florida. Uh, the uh, land use, uh, when, and uh, you know, we had a very good GIS database uh, for uh, for um, you know throughout for throughout the time period that we looked at um, agricultural crops that we picked up from 
uh, some of the district plans and also from county records, uh, crop water requirements uh, using crop models and also data from, from the South Florida Water Management District. The hydrology was pretty much uh, obtained from the district uh, modeling team um, as well as the <coughs> the projected water releases, uh, you know, primarily from uh, Lake Okeechobee. Uh, rainfall was obtained by observed data, and also we we uh, looked at global climate models that were downscaled for South Florida. Uh, lake levels uh, were. Uh, we had observations, we ha and we also had, uh, you know, the geometric characteristics of the lake, the area, the volume, the depth of, uh, you know, of the lake. We had all those measurements uh, as inputs to the model. Um, the operation of the lake, uh, this, ha this has to do with how the lake is operated, how much water is released versus the elevation of water in the lake. Um, and also how much water is demanded from the lake from the different pieces, um, from agricultural, from urban, uh, from, uh, and, uh, and also from, from ecosystem uh, uh, conservation. Uh, we looked at water reuse as well, both historically and what has been done, which in South Florida wasn't a whole lot, and also posing some scenarios of water reuse um, that could be implemented in the model. Uh, and um, uh, we also got some data on usage of water from the water utilities in South Florida. Uh, and this is just an example, for example, the, the data on population. Uh, we looked at a few scenarios of population growth, uh, a, a low scenario which, uh, in, at which uh, you know, population stays relatively where it is today, a medium scenario where it continues to grow upwards of um, almost 10 million by the, the, the end of the period of simulation 2035 and then a high which goes up to 12 million people okay and, um, and we'll see how how that goes um, uh, the the operation of Lake Okeechobee as I mentioned Lake Okeechobee is operated as a um, as a water supply reservoir, uh, the pretty much the only one that's in, in the in that part of the state. And depending if you if you look at the elevation of water in the lake, what's referred to as the lake stage. So this is the elevation of water above sea level, and this is in feet. So you know the elevation of the lake typically is somewhere between 13 and 17 or 18 of the highest. Um, depending on where it is in the year, uh, then you have essentially uh, you know five zones of operation, and depending on which zone you're at in any given point in the year, then uh, you have three scheduled releases: one to the water conservation areas, uh, and these are, if you recall, uh, these are this is the flow southward of the lake, um, the Caloosahatchee River. This is the western release um, and uh, this is the St. Lucie Canal this is the eastern release so depending on where you are uh, this is these are essentially the rules uh, through which water gets released from the lake so this was data that was provided by the South Florida Water Man Management District and that was coded into the system dynamics model in terms of evaluating uh, you know uh, water demand interventions, you know, policy interventions, things that you can actually implement to see uh, the effects. We focused primarily on um, on the domestic supply side, so we're looking uh, at policies that that can be implemented uh, by um, by users and um, uh, in, in, by domestic users. We have not yet uh, looked at the public supply, commercial, and industrial issues um, for the most part because um, the um, uh, these tend to be uh, uh, more legally uh, complicated to implement uh, but also because a lot of the commercial and industrial uh, um, users they tend to be 
more efficient in, in managing water, um, you know, because uh, um, you know water is priced uh, towards um, uh, for 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 their usage. Uh, so there there is an they have an incentive uh, to use water more efficiently. Whereas um, the the pricing of, of of domestic water, the water you and I get in our homes, is heavily subsidized. So there's little incentive uh, to do things like um, like for example conservation. Um, in kitchens, um, you know, laundry, bath and toilets, and also um, at the out at the outdoor, outdoor level, people watering their lawns, washing their cars. There's little incentive, so there, so we're trying to look at, at uh, policies that provide incentives to do that, okay, and see what the, what the effect of those would be on the on the water picture. So that that's been the focus of this so far. Um, we also looked at uh, the environmental water demands, and, and these were these were coded into the system dynamics model um, mostly as constraints. So we needed, um, you know, um, uh, the you know Lake Okeechobee uh, to be above, uh, you know, above uh, eleven feet uh, on an average of three um, uh, at three months at, at the year at the least. So because otherwise there will be the, the level will be too low, um, and we impose the flows to um, the Caloosahatchee River. This is the western discharge, uh, the St. Lucie Canal, the eastern discharge, and the southern discharge through the water conservation areas. And so these were imposed uh, as averages. And the reason to do this is that we want they didn't want, we didn't want to run into a situation where. Um, you know, we were depriving the env the environment of the ecological flow, okay, because of the big um, because of the big Everglades restoration effort going on. Uh, in terms of the climate variability and change inputs into the model, uh, there were you know we, we looked at sixteen global circulation models that were downscaled um, to a grid of twelve kilometers by twelve kilometers. Um, on a monthly on a monthly level, okay, and, and this was done by we didn't do this piece, but this data was available to us by colleagues at Santa Clara. Um, we had uh, three. We looked at three emission scenarios uh, for each uh, GCM. Uh, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with these uh, scenarios, uh, the B1, A1, B, and A2. So these are all uh, these are all fairly. Um, Aggressive, um, you know, fairly aggressive climate change, um, and uh, this is just a uh, a little bit of the list of the models that we looked at, um, uh, of the sixty models that we looked at. And they're all, a little bit all, all over the place. Now, what was interesting of doing this system dynamics model is that we purposefully uh, did it. Uh, Using a very user-centered approach, uh, so uh, we worked with 18 um, agencies, uh, in, including the the district itself. Uh, but for example, big water utilities like Miami-Dade Water and Sewer Department, which supplies water to City of Miami and surroundings. Um, we worked with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection for the environmental side of things. We also look uh, work with uh, non-governmental groups like the South Florida Regional Plan Planning Council, and the list would go on, and um, and in each case, what we would do is uh, you know establish a dialogue with them, uh, with each agency, and try to obtain uh, from each group what were sensible policies, um, and um, and also there was a, there was continuous feedback going. Um, because we had we had an interaction with these stakeholders throughout the model development process, uh, not only uh, setting up the model uh, and running the simulations, getting some results, going back to them and presenting results, coming back and making changes to the model based on their feedback. So it was a continuous communication, um, and, uh, and we, looked, we we did a lot of focus groups uh, where we had you know s smaller groups of people. So we had the large meetings, of course, but we also had focus groups continuously. Um, and um, trying also to uh, convey the understanding that these modeling tools can have a very uh, a very useful purpose in in building consensus 
and also uh, being very responsive to the information needs of decision makers uh, and in, 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 in all these stakeholder groups. Uh, so uh, you, you would hear me say this a lot, and, you know, a uh, model is not just a quantitative tool, but it's also a very effective communication tool because it facilitates you know, the dialogue process. Um, it assists the stakeholders to reach consensus, you know, and, and, and uh, we would have sessions in, we, in which we would do role games and, and we would, uh, you know, try to understand what, what other people across the room were, were thinking. And this builds confidence in the model um, because the stakeholder needs to understand how these results are produced, you know, and when that's where, you know, the interface of system dynamics is, is because it's fairly simple to assemble, you have your blocks and you have your arrows, uh, as we've been doing, it's, it's um, you know, it's fairly, it's fairly simple to assimilate by a wider group of people. Um, and uh, you also had to keep in mind that, you know, the model couldn't get too complex because you, if it gets too complex, um, you know, you, you, um, you lose simplicity, you lose this ability to communicate um, but also, you cannot make it that simple that it doesn't capture the key features of the system. So we had to to walk that fine line, and we went through many, many iterations. We've been going on through many, many iterations, and still are uh, in a, are still doing this today. <clears throat> so this is a, a little bit of an abbreviated version. Now I'm going to show you the actual model uh, in the later part of this video. This system dynamics model was uh, constructed using a different piece of software um, than Vensim. This is Stella, okay? Um, and Stella is just like a Vensim. It's just another another software tool, but you can actually understand. You can probably pick up a lot of these things here. I'm going to show you a little bit of, the, of these modules, but you can you can recognize the stocks. You know, the groundwater was a stock, surface water, agricultural land, natural land, urban land, and population. Okay, so those are the major stocks. And uh, and then you have you know the fluxes, uh, and the and the uh, and the arrows uh, of uh, these uh, these are you know what what Benson we call auxiliary variables, um, and how each piece um, feeds into it. I don't want to go too much into the details of the model because actually the purpose of this case study is not really to show you another system dynamics model, but rather to show you how it was used uh, to. To look at different policies and to interact with stakeholders and to um, and to uh, you know try to affect some change in the system. Okay, but again, the structure is, is fairly you know it's fairly similar to other other models that we've seen before. Uh, in the later part of this video, I will show you uh, the actual model that was that was used in Stella. <laughs> Um, this is a little bit of the interface of how it looks like. I'm going to show you this later. Um, but one of the things that we did is that we, we um, uh, you know, we took away uh, the the diagrammatic uh, for 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 um, for the purposes of of, of presentations. Uh, we would go into this sort of a control panel in which you have uh, you know you have knobs that you can turn up and down. And then you can see what the effects of these are. Okay, so you have, um, and these are in different categories. You have um, um, knobs that you can turn. They're they're more related to population uh, and land use. Um, you had a module on water reuse, uh, the public water supply, agricultural water demand, uh, climate uh, variability and change, um, and agricultural applications. And then, um, um, and you can actually, you know, you, and I'll show you how this works in a second. Uh, but that, that was basically the interface. And these are the same, same types of results. This is, the, this is the Stella interface. It's not that different from, from the Vensim. You can produce several graphs and you can see time histories and, and, um, uh, and you can see how those change with different, um, with different parameters. So that's, that, that, that um, part is pretty much the same as we've been discussing. Now let me show you some of the results. Um, and we looked at, uh, at a wide variety of scenarios in in this paper uh, that is in the reading list uh, f and for this case study, uh, um, uh, we focused on, on, on these interventions that I had mentioned before. Uh, you have the status quo, so that what happens if you just stay as, as you are? Um, and uh, we looked at the outcomes. Uh, what will be the water demand in 2030 
versus re the reduction of, uh, of water use in 2030 um, by implementing these policies and, um, and you know, the savings that result from that. Uh, so we looked at several policies in addition to the status quo, uh, like, for example, mandatory low-flow appliances in new homes, okay? Um, and that, what would that do to these three indicators? Um, what if you were to implement low-flow appliances uh, in 20% of the of the homes uh, by retrofitting 20 percent of the homes okay and that what would be the effect and then we said well what happens if you combine you know number two and number three and that will be number four um and that you know what would be the impact of that uh then we applied you know mandatory seriscaping which um, uh, this is basically uh landscaping to minimize water use uh so what happens if you implement it you know and uh and, uh, you know, there's a lot of landscaping in South Florida, lots of golf courses, lots of uh, gardens. And so what would happen if you, you know, if you were to do that? Um, if you do seriscaping in 20% of the old homes, what would that do? And what happens if you combined the two? Um, in pricing, we did, uh, we did several scenarios with pricing. Uh, the one we're showing here is uh, what happens if there's 30% increase in pricing across the board for every use. Which is probably not realistic, but we want to see what the what the effect of that would be, um, and then the we, we have a combined, a combined which is all all of the above essentially. You know, you have the the combined low flow, the combined seriscaping, and the pricing. So 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 nine would be essentially four uh, plus seven um, plus eight. Okay, it will be nine, and then you can see the accumulated effect. Um, and uh, you can see, you know, you can see the impact of that in tabular form. Uh, we also looked at, um, um, at questions that, okay, so what would be the required extent of, of implementation of a policy to achieve a 5% reduction in water? Demand? So if we wanted to achieve, um, and this is a very, you know, policy-oriented question, if we wanted to achieve a 5% reduction in water demand, how much of these policies will we, will we have to implement? So we looked at that question, you know, going backwards, um, and um, and uh, so here's some of the data. Uh, if we do the mandatory low flow appliances, um, if we do the retrofit of the low flow appliances, um, if we did the, if we did the com combination of these two, and also the seriscaping and the pricing. Okay, and pricing actually had a had a pretty big impact, as you can see. Um, and uh, so, so is low flow. So, so low flow appliances. So they actually do have a, you know, have a large impact on it. Okay. Um, now, once you implement these policies, and remember that that um, that you know we set uh, you know these criteria for environmental um, flow requirements, but. Um, you know, there could be a dry year or a very wet year. Uh, it can be a climate event. So, you're you're bound to to uh, to fail to meet environmental flow requirements every once in a while. So we did, you know, with the different policies, we were looking to see how many failures um, or incidences we would get over you know over the period of simulation. Okay, um, and here's that information. So this gives a a little bit of a um, of a sense of uh, of how frequently. Um, over over the period of simulation, uh, you you would essentially uh, violate or, or not be able to meet an environmental flow requirement, um, and those were you know Lake Okeechobee again the three month uh, three month uh, um, uh, above uh, eleven feet at least um, the flows uh, to the water conservation areas to the Caloosahatchee River to the St. Lucie Canal which were target flows on an annual basis. Um, uh, and the amounts, uh, you know, was in one of the previous slides. So, as I mentioned before, we did a model calibration uh, during the period of seventy-five to two thousand and five, a three-year calibration period, and um, and these uh, the the dotted line is a simulated value. Uh, the solid line is the actual um, uh, municipal demand, and this is in uh, millions of cubic meters uh, during the period of of, of time. And uh, so, this is how we were able to assess that the model was uh, was uh, reproducing reality, um, 
not only with the demand itself, but also uh, we looked at the Lake Okeechobee elevation. Um, and so this is the, the, the water level in Lake Okeechobee for that period of time. And you can see again, you know, it's fairly, you know, it's not, it's never going to be perfect, but it's actually fairly accurate. Uh, so you sort of gain the confidence that the model is doing what it's supposed to do uh, from the water balance standpoint. Um, then we looked at, at the period, uh, you know, 20, 2005 and, and, and out, and we started looking at the different, um, and so these are the values in, in, the, in the table I just showed you, but now graphed um, in terms of municipal demand uh, and the different policies. You have status quo, you have the appliances, you have the appliances plus the 20% retrofit, so these had to do with low flow appliances. This has to do, this graph has to do with seriscaping. So seriscaping didn't have, you know, didn't seem to have a whole lot of an impact. Um, low flow does um, over time. And then um, uh, here you had, uh, here's the pricing. So the pricing actually, you know, did have a, did have a, a, a an important effect, and it's no surprise because a lot of the water that's used in South Florida is subsidized. Okay, uh, and here um, you you have the the combination. So you have you know the status quo, uh, which is you know the, the solid line here, um, and then starting um, in the, you know roughly just after two thousand eight or nine, which is when you start implementing the policies, you have the low flows. The seriscaping, the pricing, and the combined, and you can actually see, you know, significant, you know, significant reductions um, in a, in a municipal water demand. Um, this here had to do with the impact of population growth. Um, so, if the population growth is and the status quo in population growth was essentially that line that we show you the project, the you know the the demographic projection, but we also looked at the at a plus minus 10% in that, and, and you can really see that the uh, population has a big effect on demand. Okay. So what we've learned so far um, with this case study is that the you know the status quo scenario um, leads to a reduction in water supply to meet environmental flow requirements, but it's really not you know it's not acceptable. It's uh, you really grow your water use. At the expense of environmental flows, um, and uh, but water conservation measures are are, are indeed effective in, in saving water and reducing the environmental flow failures uh, that we saw. And pricing appears to be a very valuable instrument for redu for reduction in water demand, so it, it should be implemented. Um, the use of low flow appliances offers a good potential. To reduce water demand, it's it's it has actually you know after pricing, it's 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 the um, you know it does have an impact. Seriscaping um, offers a little bit of a solution to reduce out, outdoor water use. Overall impact on municipal water supply doesn't appear to be that big. Um, but the nice thing is that th this model allows policymakers to to consider a com combination um, of raising prices. Um, Providing incentives for use of low flow appliances in homes and also for seriscaping to increase these potential savings in, in, in you know water use by municipalities. Now, um, one of the things that we're, we're we were able to see is that it's because the pricing uh, uh, policy has uh, has a pretty dramatic impact on water use. It's probably best to implement it in a tiered structure, meaning that you know you 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 price differently different uses of water. So so water for outdoor use, for example, um, could be priced uh, somewhat higher, um, and and that would have a bigger impact. We we saw that seriscaping didn't have a whole lot of impact when 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 priced the same, but if it's priced differently, it might have a larger impact. Um, you know and um, it would avoid um, the use of mandatory restrictions on on on, on, on um, outdoor water use, which are which are set from time to time in Florida in, in times of drought. Uh, so it's important to to avoid uh, you know regressive policies. You know the policies that um, that essentially um, uh, create a uh, you know a, a regressive a regressive consequence. Okay. 
Now, things that we're continuing to working on with this, uh, you know, there's there's no mention in this model about water quality, but certainly water quality is a, is a big issue in South Florida as well. So, um, uh, I really, I, I, I for one want to get a, a student or two to work on water quality matters, and they can take this model to the next level. Um, we also um, have not discussed yet the 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 issue of, of the economics uh, of these options, the benefit cost, which would allow a, a prioritization of policies uh, for implementation. Um, look at uh, soci social political scenarios. Uh, for example, um, you know, changing Cuba-U.S. relations and, and, the, and the status of agricultural subsidies because of that. The agricultural industry, particularly sugarcane in, in South Florida, is heavily subsidized and uh, so what would happen if, if that were to change? So that's something interesting. Um, but certainly for this study, you know, system dynamics did really provide to be a suitable tool to, mod to model this large and co fairly complex system with a reasonable degree of accuracy. So within a single model, you know, it was possible to, to use disparate uh, or, or data from disparate sources, integrating science and decision making and, and, and providing some policy support um, and, and, and gain a, a pretty good insight about the, the total system behavior rather than the behavior individual components. Uh, so looking at the, at the big picture, uh, and this facilitates uh, a, you know, more informed decisions. So that was the, you know, that's one of the lessons that we learned. Uh, so what I, want, wanna, what I wanna do next in this video is to show you, give you a snapshot of the, uh, of the Stella model that was done for the system and, and tell you a little bit about what could be done next. In this part of the video, I wanted to briefly show you the, the Stella model that was done for the South Florida water management case study. Uh, and uh, this folder that I'm showing you on the screen is the folder that you'll have on your Dropbox. And you know you have the, uh, you know, the, the case study, you have a model documentation. But what I want to show you is uh, if this South Florida water management model in Stella, this STM is the, uh, is the extension for Stella files. And I also place in the same, uh, folder uh, the installers for Stella uh, for Mac and, and Windows uh, so you can actually install it on your machine if you want these are trial versions but they'll, they'll be good enough to see the model um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna fire up the, the Stella model and you'll see one of the things that I'll show you in a second is that the the model was created using Stella version 9 and, and the, the Stella version available for download note is 10 uh, so I'm going to OK this, and, uh, and I'm going to OK this as well. Uh, so this is just a trial version. And uh, let me expand this a little bit so you can see it in, in, the, entire, um, in the entire screen. So uh, one of the, uh, first of all, I'll, I'll walk you around the model, but I'll also show you a little bit of the differences with, with the Stella software, just so it's out of curiosity. Um, so... Uh, Stella allows you to um, to create different model layers. Uh, actually, more advanced Vincent models that the version that we have been using for the class allows to do this as well. Um, Stella, however, does not have a free, uh, fully working ver version of, of the model as Vincent does, uh, which is one of the reasons that I picked Vincent for the class was because it had a fully working free model that you can use it, it even though it's simple it's actually you know very powerful but Stella doesn't have that so you actually have to buy a full license which is very expensive um, and uh, I think the cheapest one is six hundred dollars for a student so I, I, th I thought that was ridiculous to spend for a class but anyway um, you know having set that aside one of the nice things that, that this interface has is that it shows you these layers this interface is the so the control panel that I showed you uh, in you know a little bit before then it has something that's called the model map. And the model map uh, is what you would typically see in a, um, you know, in a version of, um, of Vensim as well. Uh, I'm going to, what I'm going to do, well, one of the first things that I notice is that it, it has these streaks that I have no idea what's going on. I think this is because the model was created in an earlier version of Stella because these are just going nowhere. I mean, there's no way I can see what's going on here but having set that aside uh, the, the the map of the model has uh, these modules so it's a population modules so if you click on that 
that you that you're you know you're you're zoomed in to the population piece and you can you can actually see the the population part of the model you can go back uh, you can look at land use again this is land use module I don't want to go into the details here uh, because actually this this uh, version of Stella doesn't allow you to look at the at the no like do you do in Benson that you can actually click on one of the boxes you can look at the equation it doesn't allow you to do that but you can see you have a population module a land use module a public water supply demand module an agricultural demand module, a Lake Okeechobee module. Let's look at that. And this is just the operation of Lake Okeechobee. Um, and the, the different zones, A, B, C, D, and E, and, and these things. Um, it's got the global climate model, um, which again, the 16 models, and then you sort of average them and, and you look at scenarios, the A1, B, A2, and B1. So um, um, it's got a reuse module, a groundwater module, so we can click on that. And, um, so those are nice, but uh, I, I think um, you know another thing that I that I like um, about this formulation is that you can actually look at the map. You can look at the model, which is a um, a little bit of a variation of the map. But um, one thing I like a lot here is that it actually spells out the equations. Uh, so one of the things that I'm planning on doing, just so you know, is that I'm planning to recreate um, to work with the student to recreate these. Um, uh, you know this model in um, uh, in Benson uh, using these equations. Uh, I like the Benson interface better overall, um, and uh, I think it's very useful. But look at look at all the equations that are all listed here. It's a very you know it's a fairly long model, but this can be coded fairly quickly I think in Benson as well. Um, and uh, so you got so you have a lot of tables, you know a lot of lookup tables. Very similar. This, these, these softwares are not that different. It's just a matter of, uh, of the running interface. Uh, um, but it's actually very nice, and, and uh, you can actually generate some, some nice scenarios. If you go to the interface back, um, you can click here and go to results, and the results will bring you to you know, the, the typical four, you know, typical four graphs that you can also do with Vincent. Um, and you can show the results there. So um, I didn't want to get into a whole lot of detail in this part of the video, but just show you the interface. Uh, and we've seen the results already before, uh, and uh, those have been summarized. And and um, but this actually this case study it's a, it's a very interesting um, application that, that I would like to continue. So with that said, I, I I'm going to close the video here and uh, hope uh, you enjoy uh, the case study.